Get the Intel, the podcast meant for those of us trying to find out what the hell is going on in the field. Here, we discuss tools, techniques, and approaches that you can implement to streamline operations and let you focus on your craft. Hello, Chad Gill here. I am the host of the Get the Intel podcast, where I talk with leaders in contracting, management, and really anyone helping us do business better. This episode is brought to you by Laminin Coaching. Laminin is a business coaching company with a focus on contractors in and around construction. We not only help with proposing solutions and methods, but we implement them in your business as well. After all, good ideas are not very useful until they're implemented. Workforce Recon is another sponsor. Recon is a project tracking software that connects the field to the office. So their app, Field Recon, is built with a field first mentality, developed by contractors for contractors, it can let you know what happens today rather than finding out about it days later. So check us out at workforcerecon.com and see your operation in real time. On today's episode, we have the pleasure of hosting Doug Buck. Uh, Doug Book, there we go. And he is the inventor and founder of the Paved Drain System. A former farm boy who graduated from the University of Ohio in 1992 and landed in technical sales in the construction industry. In 1996, he focused on the precast concrete and masonry industry, including erosion control and stormwater management. He started Paved Dream LLC in August of 2009, where they have manufactured over 6 million square feet in 30 different block facilities across the U.S. and Canada. So, Doug, uh, thanks for joining. Sorry I got the name wrong in the first shot there. I was, I was, yeah. I was thinking we were doing well with Buck, and I was like, you know, we didn't go with Boosh, so I guess that's yeah. good too. Chad, you're not the first one that's ever messed it up, just to let you know. So you know, uh, go. you're in good company. <laughs> Let's just hope I learn from it. Probably not. Yeah. Thanks for having time. me on. Really, really appreciate you having me on. I uh, love it. So former farm boy, University of Ohio. Uh, Iowa. I, I mean, University of Iowa. Iowa. I'm staring right at it. How can I get that wrong? Uh, it's four, you know, four letter words. Man, what can I tell you? Yeah, right. Uh, usually my specialty. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, so how did that go? So you, you, you come out and you get into technical sales, you know, like construction is for me, um, but, but now we need to you know, create a company. I mean, what was that path like? Yeah, that, uh, the path was I was in distribution selling uh, geotextiles, geosynthetics. Uh, I liked the contracting world, enjoyed the specifying side of, the, of that market as well. Kind of get a hang out with the supposedly the intellectual side with the engineering engineering side of it and then you go out into the mud and the dirt with the contractors and the custom and swearing and uh, <laughs> equipment breaking down and people throwing stuff at you and I it kind of fit the farm boy mentality of you, know, you got to think about what you're doing but you also got to just get to work and go uh, you know physically uh, put it together so uh, but I was in the roach control world and I was on a stream bank stabilization job and uh, I was working with this contractor slash engineer design build project. It was happened to be in Indianapolis. And uh, this uh, guy engineer just said, you know, if we want to stop the stream bank degradation and all of our stream bank damage that's going on across the country, coast to coast, we got to start capturing this water a lot farther upstream, meaning that all of this runoff coming off the parking lots, the roofs, streets, alleyways, you name it, that needs to start going in the ground. Because when these streams were you know, 1,500, even 500 years ago, they were never intended to handle this much water that is a, is hitting them. And that's why they're degrading so fast, so hard, and why we're never getting out in front of it. So you can spend all the money you want on stream bank stabilization. You're never going to do it unless you take some of that water off of that top end. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, people don't think about it as like that, you know, we are, we are perpetually growing the size of the watershed. Um, just through our ability to channel water. It wasn't, you know, wasn't designed that way. No, Mother Nature's hydrograph, you know, nice little curve. And here it is, man's hydrograph with asphalt, concrete, roofs, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> right. you know, just as opposite as it can be, we can't, and it, it's not working. People know it. I think we've all known it for quite some time. So kind of got me yeah. into, the, into the world. And you're talking about tremendous volumes of water, like, yeah. you know, you know, acres of rain coming down and going into one channel. That's crazy. Acre feet. Talk about thousands of thousands of, of CFS blowing through a channel that was meant to handle a hundred CFS on a big on a big day. And it's it's not that it handles it every once in a while, it handles it 
has to handle it every storm event. And we're just, we're not doing it. We're not doing it right. And I think we all kind of know that then the civil engineering side of stuff, we've got some, uh, got some problems when you take a rain, a drop of rain and it lands here. And our idea is to pipe it 20, 30, 40 miles yeah. away. And that's solving it becomes a little bit, uh, wait, what did we really, are we really doing this? And, you know, maybe we can't do all of that, but, uh, I, I, I say a lot of that there's a, there's gotta be a better balance. There's not just, it's a lot of times we're always, you know, the pendulum always swinging from one side to the other, and there's gotta be a better balance of putting some of it in the ground right where it lands and maybe taking it somewhere to, to some other detention pond or underground detention system or somewhere to find some balance where we're not just hammering these streams, dumping it all into there. And uh, it's a little better, uh, better, better for mother nature, better for the municipality, better for land value, better. It's just an all around win, win, win. So what is the so stormwater management? So you're talking about pervious paving in general and uh, in this scenario. So is, is the goal that you want to channel the water to go into the ground under there and that's where it goes? Or are you talking about building up kind of like a battery storage of water that then you can disseminate more slowly? Yep. Both. Yeah. Both. Yep. Bit of both. One of my favorite things. So a bit of both. So Peter <laughs> Quill from uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. So yeah, it's uh, the, it to just say we're always going to do it like this, you know, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work like that. And likewise, when we talk about this, uh, taking on some of that water, aquifers matter. And we have paved, roofed, cut off a lot of water from getting down to these aquifers. It takes about, depending on your soil types, depth of the aquifer, can take anywhere from 75 to 500 years for that water to get, work its way down, gravity still works, work its way down through the clay, through everything and down into that aquifer. Mother nature, she's been really good at cleaning water for a really long time. And we're not giving her the chance to do it, to get it back down to those aquifers, to pump it back up and, and reuse it. When now that water is getting cut off from getting down in there, how are we supposed to replenish it? Uh, we detain it. We now pipe it. We put it in a river. We put it in a pond. Uh, it sits in a detention pond. These are probably detention ponds are, I, I just think are the, are just borderline evil. Uh, they, they suck up valuable land. They are a mosquito haven. They're a liability. They cost money to build. Now go maintain it. Now go dredge it and tell me how that, that works on a, on a budget and suck all that nasty debris out that's all toxic. Now you got to haul it off and put it somewhere. And then on top of it, you're just still sitting there with water that now is exposed. All that water 40, 50 years ago used to be in the ground. Now it's up there. Well, then it evaporates. Then it gets up in the clouds. Now it's up in there and now it comes back down. That's part of my, this is not my theory. This is a, a theory from uh, some uh, people from the University of Wisconsin, much smarter than me that talked about you know, the intensity of the storms, does anybody think all this intensity of storms doesn't have anything to do with an aerial photo of go over any municipality in the United States and how many more exposed ponds we have than we did before the Clean Water Act took effect in, you know, 1906? I never even considered that. Well, I mean, it's not that interesting, but man, I mean, yeah, you would think, okay, well, this makes great sense, but it's like what you're saying, it's, you just put a lot more water back up rather than down. That's it. Let her get down. Let Mother Nature do what she's doing. But we got to we got to have a way, a, a vehicle, so to speak, to get that water effectively back down into the ground. We know clay soils don't drain more fast. We know every but en every engineer and every owner. Hey, we got to it's clay. We can't we can't let it infiltrate. It's clay. We can't let it do it. Well, OK, maybe there's a balance to that. Do we dig it a little deeper? Do we try and get gut butts bust through the clay? Do we try and uh, put more underground detention in there and still let it infiltrate down into the ground uh, and let aquifers uh, get replenished and let that water soak back down into there? All of this stuff comes into, but how do we get it in there effectively and consistently with minimal maintenance, yet still drive on it and feel and act like traditional asphalt concrete, which is why I came up with uh, with the paved drain system to help uh, push that uh, that forward. So how does it work? So you, you're doing, do you have to create a basin underneath the paved drain and then 
uh, and then water sits in and around the gravel and then you slowly just seeps into the ground that's underneath that in a in a very simplistic world yep that's it Perfect. uh our oh, underground okay. rock. You're done. You're high. We're done. That was the fastest podcast you ever had, Chad. Right. You're done. That's right. Describe yourself in one word. <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, there's open graded aggregate underneath it. Engineering volume goes into it. Typically open graded aggregate has about a 40% void space to it. Generally around the country, some engineers say a little less than that, but uh, generally 40% is pretty much universally thought of. So if you have a uh, good size of chunk of rock or a print of uh, uh, open graded aggregate underneath it, you've got a lot of storage uh, built in uh, underneath the, the paved drain system. And sometimes we can include underground uh, storage underneath there, chambers, uh, box chambers underneath it, uh, culverts to help even bulk up and add on to that, that uh, storage volumes as well, because you're, many times you're trying to take a massive roof with a lot of traditional asphalt and uh, the proverbial stuff, uh, 10 pounds of poop in a five pound box and uh, makes it very challenging for these engineers to do that without uh, digging halfway to China to get the, get enough storage volume in there. So, but we can, again, it's a lot of this just comes down to a, a balancing act. A, a lot of, I ripped on ponds earlier, but maybe a water feature is is that you know a three and a half acre pond man you're sucking up a lot of land but how about a you know a five thousand square foot water feature uh built as a part of this with underground storage and paved drain all around it feeding it itself infiltrating some of it uh, a capture infiltrate system uh evaporate as well with a uh, maybe had a, a fountain on it or something like that just something to make it make it all work better than underground detention pond. That's all we do, and it, it's just we gotta we gotta think a little bit outside that uh, you know gotta think outside that box a little bit and uh, okay. find a better find a better balance. Man, that's great. So, what about you know? So when you're taking it, what keeps you from taking you know? I mean, the water isn't like the cleanest. I mean, is it is there a lot of heat coming? Well, I guess it's it's pretty clean. It's coming down from the rain. You know, it's just it lands on it. Does it clog up? Does dirt and debris clog these things over time, or is there filters? Yeah, that, yeah, that's been one of the big things with the permeable world is uh, is maintenance. Who said you know I love maintenance? That's all so, of them. maintenance. Yes, yeah, so no one ever right. No, everybody relationships, just, you yeah. know, animals, and, all and, of it. equipment, all of it. Somebody should probably paint that. Somebody should probably fix that, right? Somebody should probably do some maintenance on that. You know, nobody wants to talk about maintenance except for us. We uh, we really have uh, pushed hard on this. The uh, uh, other permeable surfaces, uh, permeable asphalt, concrete, uh, permeable paver type world, they are really tend to clog. And and then once they're clogged, now you're really in trouble. Now you really got some work to do. And engineers, you know, they don't like risk. <laughs> they like uh, they like sure things. They uh, right. want to make sure that hey, this is this is supposed to work. And uh, I have a saying out there: time plus truth equals trust. And I think it's uh, it's really a and if they can trust something uh, that's proven itself time and time again, they're it's they're going to keep going with it. And you, but that takes time because you introduce a in, in a project or a product new product to an engineer. How many of them just jump all over everything? Oh, I can't wait to use that. I got, you know, they're going to browbeat it, talk about it, beat up on it, question it. I, I don't know about that. And then they're going to question this, question that. Of course, finally, I'm hoping somebody else does it three or four times because then I'll do it. And that yeah. is the nature of the engineering world. That's just kind of the way, the way that uh, engineers get built. And it's okay to question it. It's okay to do, do that. But now we've been at it about uh, a little over a, a, a approaching 12 years and we proved a lot of skeptics that okay this does keep working maintenance is is minimal uh if at any uh but when you do have to do it it's it's quite simplistic you just need pure vacuum equipment just a lot of not big leaf blowers regenerative air you need pure vacuum equipment concentrated vacuum suck it out you're done you have to go buy rock and refill it you're just done huh. and i mean through your perm your your paper 
through the block, through the open joints of the block. So the blocks themselves are not permeable. The permeability comes in the interlock and the size and the bulk of them. So our joints are left open. It's an open joint concept that allows all the water to just flow down in as fast as it can take it on. Uh, example of this is the ASTM test uh, called C1701 or the bucket test that, that, that gets uh, incorporated into this basically a five gallon pail filled with water and you pour it into a another five gallon pail with the bottom cut off of it uh, through the permeable surface and you time how long it takes for that water to infiltrate down through it. Most permeable surfaces, brand new, will infiltrate at pervious uh, asphalt and concrete around five, 600 inches per hour. It's pretty good. Permeable pavers, they'll be around uh, 500 brand new. Uh, fill it with rock joints and how you rock it, depending on the type of rock they put between the gaps. You can be uh, start off and you might be around 150, 200 inches per hour uh, out there, but paved drain brand new. Uh, we have more than one documented uh, infiltration test of over 2000 inches per hour. Now, if your threshold of failure is 10 inches an hour or eight inches an hour, when that start, start to, starts to fail, wouldn't you rather be near, closer to 2000 than 100 or, if, or 500? inches because if your intent eight to ten inches is your failure mechanism you're already at 500 you you don't have that far to go so yeah. uh we just kind of played a little bit of a math game and and just started pushing this maintenance thing on and everybody to question it you should talk about it and we take we've taken it so far that we partnered with uh another company out there who you would be have a fun time interviewing called p4 infrastructure out of milwaukee wisconsin and they uh, worked with them, three professors, all from the University of Marquette, RSGs, as I call them, really smart guys. <laughs> and they, th we sat down and whiteboarded a little, uh, here's what I want to do. I want to go to an existing paved drain job. I want to remove a block or two. I want to drive a, a stainless steel float valve down through that open graded rock, whatever depth it is, two feet, three feet, four feet, whatever it is. And I want to put some sort of sensor on there that tells us what that water level is doing in these clay environments. How fast is it draining? Does the, does the paved drain system and everything need to be uh, maintained? Because last year we got a half inch rain event, we got this much water. And this year we got a half inch and we got that much water. So is that, so rather than being humans or subjective, it's very electronically documented. Here's what it is. Here's what it's doing. Here's how much water we took on. And what a story for a municipality to tell the constituents, hey, uh, we just captured 1.8 million gallons of stormwater that didn't get sent to the wastewater treatment plant if you're combined sewer or off to the lakes or the ponds, it's going back into the ground, yay, and all that stuff. So we worked with them, lo and behold, about a year in, we had a developed, we got a, and we got working miles. We've now sold about 20 of these units around the country. And- Can you leave them in place? Leave them in there, solar nice. operated, you get the solar bat and get the battery either in the block or we can get it up out of the block near a street and run a wire and run it up a flagpole or a street sign. Nobody ever knows that this little solar panel is up top about that big. And it'll send uh, 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 measurements directly to your laptop and tell you, your, uh, and tell you just how much water your municipality has captured, infiltrated or not. It's like the and water thing on the uh, water fountains. Yeah, like you <laughs> save You've saved one billion bottles or something. Exactly. It's all that all that type of stuff. It's a it's a great messaging tool, and uh, uh, it took us a while, like anything, to get going. It takes a minute, but uh, now that we're kind of uh, got several municipalities that are interested in it, if you got to meet a consent decree, if your municipality has to meet a consent decree uh, that laid out by the EPA, hey, this is one heck of a way to uh, to to do it. Uh, We've got one in Maryland uh, on part of a project, and it is absolutely obliterating all the models on what they thought was going on. <laughs> how about that? So how about that? So as part of the Chesape Chesapeake Bay watershed, it's uh, it's quite uh, telling information after a, the latest report card came out, which was basically a, you know, look like my report card, a D plus. <laughs> yeah, I've had a few of those. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what they say? D's get degrees. We're okay. That's right. We made it. <laughs> That's we made right. it. I mean, we're out. Right. And that is fantastic. So, uh, 
so going through the process, launching, doing all those kind of things, you know, what's a, what's like one of the biggest challenges, or maybe it's still a big challenge for you. What's something that you look at? I mean, I, if I could just cap this one, not so much about the product thing, but more yeah. about like doing this business. Concrete, as long as it's been around, man, are we still learning a lot about it? I mean, we lost it for a long time, you know, right? Both all around, and then they lost. Who loses the recipe? Who was who not in recipe? charge of the recipe? It's like your mother's favorite goulash recipe. Who loses that? You know, right? I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. So uh, we've uh, we really like one of the things we really appreciate about the concrete industry is our ability to go to block manufacturing facilities all across the country. Uh, it's to the point now, almost name a state, and we've been there, uh, including Hawaii, you know, Florida, Texas, Washington State, all over the Midwest, East Coast, uh, to be able to take a, uh, a product like masonry concrete and have it made real close to home and ship it. We really try to keep it within 350, 400 miles. That's, oh, wow. not, very far. That's not very far at all. And oh. That is a, hey, rumor has it, fuel might change. <laughs> it might go up. It might go down. Probably going to go up. Probably never going to go down. But that's been a little bit of our philosophy is let's, uh, let's take advantage of that and try to establish relationships with the, with the concrete producers all across the country. Uh, and, then it, and then word spreads, you know. Oh man, these guys are great to work with. You know, this guy, he used to run my plant. He had to uh, move over to here, runs this plant now. Great guy, get in touch with him. And all of a sudden you're connecting dots and meeting people and, uh, you know, slapping each other on the back and enjoying a bourbon over uh, over some success. There's nothing wrong with it. So your company is based on that. You have the design, the text and all that kind of stuff. And I'm assuming the molds, and then you have them regionally made so that you can you can get out to it because like I said, freight would be a killer. Oh, freight's killer. Freight is just, uh, and it's getting harder. To, they're getting harder to find. Flatbeds are tough, uh, getting harder and harder to find. Uh, we, every, about every dime we make, we plunk it right back into the company, buy more molds, uh, have them sitting there. They used to travel about eight, nine states around. Now it's about three, four states and we keep them very regionally. And that way, if one of the uh, block plants doesn't clean it right, they 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 know where it came from, and they call them up and they chew them out, and then <laughs> we don't have to get in the middle of it. But right. that's good. so. But no, it's the concrete in industry is awesome and and uh, frustrating and growing, and yet we still are just learning. We have. Uh, stuff we're doing now differently than we, than we started 10 years ago. And one of the biggest things we've really taken on is uh, sealing uh, the paved rain system after it's in, especially in our salty environments. Uh, salt is just, just gives me the willies thinking about salt and uh, up our Northern, our Northern climates and Michigan and the Pacific and the uh, Northeast part of the country and uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and, Oh, the salt is just, so we spent a lot of time on uh, educating people that sealing is maintenance. Yeah. It's important. Uh, if I could, if there's stuff we're trying to get out of or get people away from is educate people on salt is just, is terrible. It's terrible for, it's not terrible on everything, but a margarita and, and some, and some, and some food and potato chips. Oh, Beyond yeah. that, I mean, that stuff is just gets into the water, gets into our water, and we can't get it out. We, gotta be, we almost have to build desalination plants in some of our cities to, because our wells are becoming uh, toxic and our uh, hypertension's be, been uh, noted to be up. Uh, and it's a lot of it because of salt. They can't get it out. Isn't that crazy? Isn't um, it? Yeah, we do that a lot. We have people, you know, we're trying to put salt inhibitors and stuff like that down on, on uh, floors that we do and that kind of thing. And they're like, well, what should we do? I was like, stop using salt as a de-icer. They're like, well, we only use salt. I didn't ask you what you, you asked me what I should do. I told you what you should do. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's exactly. It's that why we put it up the, the heated side of stuff because we've just, we've had municipalities that have come to us and just said, we have replaced this walkway, walking into this front, under this building, our Department of Public Works building, we have replaced it two times in 10 years. And the thresholds go out every other year 
the rugs, the carpeting, and the woodwork, everything is getting damaged by this salt. We're done. So that's the heated stuff is starting to become really intriguing for us too. Very fun. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So yeah, that, that I, yeah, that's uh, where you can heat through your channels underneath of that. I assume. Oh yeah, it's uh, and and we do it all to hydronic uh, heating and run it through PEX uh, PEX or uh, Upanor type tubing little propylene glycol cycling through that. A lot of times these buildings already have boilers in them. So this is just a very simple add-on pump to do it. And, and away you oh, go. You got, heat, yeah, you got just regular heat you're trying to get rid of. Yeah, exactly. That, and that's what's, we're, we, got a, we got a project we're working on where we're trying to take waste heat and pump it through uh, tubing on a, on a street and uh, melt snow, shovel the snow to it and melt it right on, right on spot and, and let it infiltrate back down into the ground. Don't haul it off anymore. No salt. Now that's a great idea. Oh my God. Here I was trying to do it with a mobile laser truck. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> laser. We need a, more lasers. Right I now. mean, we're still going to need a laser. It just might not be for that. It just not be for that because I, the hard part is get aware that where do we stop it? So, yeah. <laughs> that's right. And getting mini me to stop pumping it. You're right. <laughs> 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 man this has been great doug i really appreciate your time uh, i love learning about different things that are being done especially in concrete and uh sounds like sounds like you've got it going on man so thank you very much and uh i look Thanks forward to it let's do it again yes sir thank you Thanks for listening to Get the Intel. We'll see you next time, and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. 